Our first speaker will be Dr. Payam Akhavan. He is the uh, co-founder of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. He's also a professor of law at McGill University. Uh, he was previously the first legal advisor to the Office of the Prosecutor in International Criminal Tribu Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, distinguished members of the Commission, for this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's the French Monsieur le Président we're used to in Montreal. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, distinguished members of the Commission, I'm grateful for this uh, second opportunity to address you uh, in the presence of such eminent experts. I'd like to make some broad remarks about the context within which we should understand the human rights situation in Iran and to specifically address the importance of holding uh, individual Iranian officials accountable for human rights violations as part of a broader process of uh, a democratic transformation. The question of religious freedom challenges the core of the legitimacy of an authoritarian theocratic state. In the Islamic Republic of Iran, state power is based on the myth that there is only a single incontestable interpretation of Islam as defined by unelected religious clerics and others in the inner circle of the ruling class. This ideology of exclusive authenticity is invoked to justify constitutional structures that subordinate democratic aspirations to the self-proclaimed divine mandate of clerics who claim to be accountable only to God. Thousands are disqualified from elections because the Council of Guardians does not approve their Islamic credentials, and any expression of criticism that vaguely threatens those in power is deemed to be un-Islamic and subject to punishment. Leaving aside the burgeoning Islamic reformists and secular Democrats, this myth of Islamic authenticity is easily exposed by dissent in the ranks of senior ayatollahs who bemoan the corruption of their venerable tradition by the profane temptations of power. It is in this context that the discourse of the Islamic Republic and its demonization of religious minorities, its democratic opponents and others should be understood. The construction of enemies is a fundamental attribute of authoritarianism. The obsessive focus on threats posed by external enemies is an integral aspect of the political homogenization that justifies repre repression of internal enemies that are invariably portrayed as agents of American imperialism or Zionism. Authentic indigenous calls for democracy and human rights are transformed into a foreign conspiracy against Islam and Iranian sovereignty. Challenging the unchecked power of the clerics is depicted as blasphemy. A public dissatisfied with economic decline and political repression is silenced by the rhetoric of militant survivalism in the face of an imminent threat, whether an American military attack or the prospect of a velvet revolution by Iranians both of which are viewed as part of the same transaction. The all-consuming Western emphasis on Iran's nuclear program has allowed President Ahmadinejad's apocalyptic hate-mongering to eclipse the aspirations of Iran's overwhelmingly youthful population, 70% of whom are 30 years of age and under. While the Western media dwells on exoticized images of Islamic terrorists in the post-9-11 world, a profound and irresistible demogra demographic chef shift is redefining Iranian society from within. This is a disillusioned, post-ideological generation that dreams of a prosperous and open society built on democracy and the rule of law. It is a generation that is internet savvy, glued to satellite television, and no longer satisfied by the clash of civilizations rhetoric that increasingly unpopular leaders peddle because they have nothing else to offer their people. It is a diverse and dynamic society of student activists and public intellectuals, journalists and web loggers, feminists and artists, teachers and bus drivers unions, the complex but intertwined ingredients of an emerging civil society that is by far the biggest threat to Tehran's hardliners, as demonstrated by increasing desperation to infiltrate the NGO community and to arrest and prosecute its leaders. Throughout its modern history, Iran has been a trophy in the machinations of foreign powers with little regard for the welfare of its people. 
Today, Iran is viewed primarily through the prism of nuclear non-proliferation, energy security, and regional stability. While UN resolutions periodically condemn Iran's human rights record, there is no serious consideration given to the aspirations of the long-suffering Iranian people whose voices are displaced by the logic of realpolitik. On the one hand, there is fear of military conflict over the nuclear issue, and help strengthen the hand of hardliners in the name of fighting the common enemy. On the other hand, there is the equal fear of a grand bargain with Iran, which will lead to Western toleration of human rights abuses in the name of national self-interest. In both scenarios, the Iranian people lose. At this critical juncture, the core of a principled foreign policy must consist of a twin strategy of empowering the Iranian people while isolating those that stand in their way.